and it appears at the Trump White House, Marine Corps One isn't the only helicopter that lands. There's also a landing zone for the infamous Black Chinook that only picks up folks, and it seems to happen particularly on Friday. And so it was, the news came last Friday, again, that President Trump's chief strategist, Steve Bannon, had been relieved of his duties, resigned, dismissed, fired, sent home. Whatever you wanted to call it, the Black Chinook had landed. Funny, I recently saw an early Trump Oval Office picture. There was the president, the vice president, and four other individuals for whom the Black Chinook had manifested, LTG Michael Flynn, Sean Spicer, Reince Priebus, and now Steve Bannon. That's what I call a pretty hefty personnel turnover in your first seven months. And after each departure there's been much pundit prognostication and assessment, but the departure of Steve Bannon is the most interesting. Nutty Nancy Pelosi and Maxine Mad Max Waters tend to believe there are white supremacists running all over the White House, hardly the case. But, within hours of departing, Mr. Bannon was back at Breitbart and had reassumed his leading role. He issued an interesting message that conveys the real meaning behind his departure. He stated, The Trump presidency that we fought for, and won, is over, Bannon said Friday, shortly after confirming his departure. We still have a huge movement, and we will make something of this Trump presidency. But that presidency is over. It'll be something else. And there'll be all kinds of fights, and there'll be good days and bad days, but that presidency is over. Those words say it all, and I've been watching folks all this past weekend fumbling all over themselves trying to explain this. You all know me, so I'll cut right to the chase. What Mr. Bannon means is the presidency that was won back in November 2016 was won for the forgotten man and woman. It was won many believed would restore America's first principles and values, that of a constitutional republic, its sovereignty, and its rule of law. It was believed that the establishment swamp would be drained and servant leadership would be restored to Washington, D.C., as opposed to self-serving and special interest promotion. We hear so many talk about the Trump agenda, but what does that really mean, and is anyone on board with it? Constitutional conservatives believe in limited federal government, fiscal responsibility, individual liberty, free market, free enterprise economy, and a strong national defense. Of course, the delusional progressive socialist left would call that extreme, and even some Republicans run away from those principles but we were all under the assumption that was where the Trump presidency was heading. But ask yourself today, who are the constitutional conservatives in the Trump White House? Trump's daughter, Ivka, and son-in-law Jared Kushner, are well-known liberal progressives, yet they have a close ear of President Trump. Economic advisor, Gary Cohn, is certainly not known for being a conservative, as a matter of fact, he's another New York liberal progressive. Secretary of the Treasury, Steve Nutchen. Well, sometimes I don't know if he knows what he is, but he certainly hasn't advanced a conservative tax reform policy, if any policy at all. God bless him, but Secretary of Defense General James Mattis wanted the person Hillary Clinton had begged for her sec def, Michelle Fournoy, as his Deputy Secretary of Defense and many of the DOD positions are being filled with former defense industry executives and lobbyists, some kind of swamp draining. And if you want to know the direction that Mr. Bannon's Briette Bart will be taking, just read this past weekend's piece by Aaron Klein on National Security Advisor, LTG H. R. McMaster. And there's no doubt that LTG McMaster has a completely different national security vision from President Trump, case in point, the Iran nuclear deal. The Trump White House is now one of NYC liberal progressives and Obama holdovers. This is what Mr. Bannon meant by his assertion of a certain presidency being over. I would expect some others to be looking to the skies for the Black Chinook, those individuals would be Dr. Sebastian Gorka, Stephen Miller, and sadly, we haven't been seeing much of Kellyanne Conway recently. Yes, I understand a campaign is different from running the nation but fundamental principles are important. I wish I could say I have, but I've never heard President Trump speak on the values of the Founding Fathers and our Constitution. 
I've never seen him tweet about the value of free market principles and how his policies will reinforce that belief. My concern is that we may never hear statements to that effect. The outward appearance and perception is that the swamp has won and President Trump will move further away from what enabled him to pull off an incredible upset victory. The liberal progressive left has done a fine job in denigrating and disparaging that which it fears. Liberty and freedom of the common American citizen. And there are even Republicans who have joined sides with the liberal progressive leftists in thwarting what American people voted for last November. There's been a slip in President Trump's base of support, hence why he's heading out for a campaign-style rally in Arizona. The recent lunacy of the left and their assault against statues and monuments somewhat stabilized President Trump's support. But it's the policy direction of this White House which should cause concern. And this is what Mr. Bannon has brought to our attention with his statement. Where does the Trump White House go from here? President Trump is a different type of political figure in that he's never really embraced or expounded upon his philosophy of governance. He's shown himself to be a populist and a showman who is adept in the moment. But any leader needs guiding principles and values. Let's hope President Donald J. Trump isn't about to demonstrate that he's just like all the rest, another politician saying what's necessary to get elected. Do I think Mr. Bannon's position will be filled? Nope. The real meaning behind Mr. Bannon's departure is that no one really knows what President Trump's agenda is. But we do know those closest to him did not share an ideological philosophy of governance consistent with constitutional conservatism. Will and Grace ask for six hero senators to stand up and impeach Trump, here's what they missed. Will and Grace actors Deborah Messing and Eric McCormack voice their disapproval of President Donald Trump in the way many of his critics have, with a call for his impeachment. They responded to an opinion piece published by Newsweek that screamed in all caps on the page, Trump is just six Senate votes away from impeachment. And while the article very clearly outlined the process, noting that the president must first be impeached by the House of Representatives, where it would likely be far more difficult to get the majority to vote against him, for a Senate vote to be relevant at all, the headline and feature photo did not reflect that at all. McCormack started the Alert Al Sharpton Issues Nasty Demand to Americans There is a fierce debate over whether or not Confederate statues should be removed, or at the very least, moved. Veteran Ray Spader, Al Sharpton, recently voiced his opinion on what should be done with our nation's Civil War monuments. According to Independent Journal Review, not only does Sharpton think that Confederate statues need to, to be removed, but he also believes that federal funding to the legendary Jefferson Memorial needs to stop as well. His reasoning is that he doesn't think tax dollars should go towards supporting a statue of a slave owner. Sharpton's stance is quite ironic, since he was recently under fire for tax evasion. Sharpton made his announcement not long after President Trump asked during a press conference Are we going to take down statues to George Washington? How about Thomas Jefferson? At the time of his comment, President Trump seemed to be asking, sarcastically, if we should erase all of history. The point was to show how insane the Democrats' attempt to destroy history seemed. Instead of seeing the point that the president was trying to make, liberals saw it as a call to arms. Sharpton explained his point of view further during an interview with Charlie Rose on PBS. People need to understand that people were enslaved, Sharpton stated. It is almost as if he believes people deny slavery existed here, or deny that it continues to exist right now in some parts of the world. As you would imagine, many people are frustrated with Sharpton's point of view. What is most irritating to some people is his bold statement that tax dollars are used to keep the Jefferson Memorial in good shape, when he's been accused of not paying taxes in the past. The New York Times reported that he has a total of $4.5 million in unpaid taxes between federal and state balances owed. In fact, his for-profit group, the National Action Network, has been in business for years, and there are signs that not a single dollar of theirs went towards paying federal payroll taxes. Despite not paying his taxes, Sharpton still traveled first class, received an impressive salary, 
and refused to pay travel agencies, hotels, and landlords. It seems odd that someone who never can be bothered to pay for things is worried about where our tax dollars are going. After Al Sharpton's statement, the internet bit back. One user tweeted, Al Sharpton doesn't pay his taxes but is concerned about the use of taxpayer dollars for public monuments. None of those dollars are his. Another user pointed out that, Al Sharpton should pay his back taxes before he preaches on public funds. Quite a valid point, yet the irony of the situation seems to escape Al Sharpton. The lesson here is simple. You cannot erase history just because it makes you uncomfortable. Furthermore, if you are going to avoid paying taxes, you should not preach about how upset you are over where the tax dollars are going. What we see here is liberal hypocrisy as its absolute finest. New News Network will be more pro-Trump than Fox. Fox News better get their act together, because if this news is true, they're about to be in big trouble. As Fox News leans much more to the left, thanks to Rupert Murdoch's liberal sons running the network, many conservatives are looking elsewhere for their non-biased news. In walks Steve Bannon, the powerhouse at Breitbart, who is rumored to be starting a conservative news network. Can you imagine? We love this idea. From BizBake Review, Steve Bannon's next steps might be a big blow to Fox News. Rumors are circulating that the former White House chief strategist is planning to launch a news network that is more conservative than Fox, according to Axios. According to reporter Jonathan Swan, friends of Bannon have said the Breitbart executive chairman sees Fox News heading toward the center of the political spectrum, which creates an opening to the right of Fox. They don't know if the network is going to be an online streaming service like Netflix or an actual television station. Before former Fox News head Roger Riles died earlier this year he met with Bannon and discussed the idea of starting a network together and Bannon loved the idea, according to Axios. One thing causing speculation that a new network is in the offing is that Bannon took a meeting with Long Island billionaire Robert Mercer, who has backed other Bannon projects. Justice. Violent Missouri lawmaker who called for Trump's death just got ruthless news from Lt. Gov. Missouri Lt. Gov. Mike Parson just gave a sobering heads up to a state senator who has called for the association of President Trump. Parson has given her a deadline of September 13 to resign or the Senate will expel her. Payson has called to her this arrogant senator's attention a section of the Missouri Constitution that penalizes lawmakers guilty of contempt and disorderly conduct. Missouri Democratic State Senator Maria Chappelle Nadal called for the assassination President Donald Trump last week in a Facebook post that stated, I hope Trump is assassinated. During an exchange with a left-wing activist who claimed a family relative was a Secret Service agent. According to the Springfield News Leader, Parson stipulated that Chappelle Nadal must resign by September, the date of the upcoming veto session, or deal with expulsion from the Senate. Related, Missouri Senator, I hope Trump is assassinated. Missouri Democratic and Republican lawmakers called for her to resign from her seat, including most recently Democratic Missouri Representative Emanuel Cleaver. I'm not going to do something that I haven't heard many Republicans do on the air or in private. Anyone who labels anyone or any group of all races unless that is the purpose of the group, I disagree with it. A state senator here in Missouri called for the assassination of Donald Trump, Cleaver said on Fox News Saturday. About 30 seconds after she made the comment, I issued a request for her resignation. She does not deserve to be an elected official in the state that I love Missouri. She doesn't deserve to anywhere in this country. USA Today reported Missouri Democratic. Senator Claire McCaskill criticized Chappelle Nadal, saying, it's outrageous. And she should resign. Missouri Democratic Representative Lacey Clay also denounced the Facebook post. Missouri State Senate Democratic leader Gina Walsh called the comment horrible and said her behavior has no place in our caucus. Chappelle Nadal has been defiant in calls from her own party of Democrats to step down but it looks like that choix is going to be made for her. Do you think this state senator has no place in holding office after calling for the death of the president?
Atlantic writer U.S. Eclipse delivers blackness across path of all white people. On Monday, August 21st, millions of Americans will be outside watching a solar eclipse, which in some parts of the country will be total. During totality, which may last only a few minutes, nocturnal animals will become active while others nest as though it were actually nightfall. And because neither the sun nor the moon is visible at that point, the darkness will indeed be total. The science of the eclipse is fairly simple, there is an easily predictable path of totality, and those outside that path will view only a partial eclipse. Although there are usually two solar eclipses annually, there can be as many as five, the paths differ enough that specific locations may go years, even centuries, between total eclipses. For example, St. Louis, Missouri, is in the path of totality for Monday's eclipse. The last total eclipse visible from St. Louis occurred 400 years ago. Monday's path, according to NASA, looks like this, but as people get ready to view the eclipse, some traveling hundreds of miles to get a better view, people have been offering up theories regarding this eclipse's path of totality. None of them are based in science, and each is more outrageous than the last. The Boston Globe published an article in early August suggesting that the eclipse was following a path of Trump supporters, a stretch, considering the fact that the eclipse can be seen in near totality at least the 48 contiguous states. But the most recent offering, from Alice Ristroff of The Atlantic, puts a racial twist on the path of the eclipse. Ristroff suggests that the path of totality will introduce blackness to areas of the country that are predominantly white. She writes, on August 21, 2017, a total solar eclipse will arrive mid-morning on the coast of Oregon. The moon's shadow will be about 70 miles wide, and it will race across the country faster than the speed of sound, exiting the eastern seaboard shortly before 3 p.m. local time. It has been dubbed the Great American Eclipse, and along most of its path, there live almost no black people. Presumably. This is not explained by the implicit bias of the solar system. It is a matter of population density, and more specifically geographic variations in population density by race, for which the sun and the moon cannot be held responsible. Still, an eclipse chaser is always tempted to believe that the skies are relaying a message. At a moment of deep disagreement about the nation's best path forward, here comes a giant round shadow drawing a line either to cut the country in two or to unite it as one. Ancient peoples watched total eclipses with awe and often dread, seeing in the darkness omens of doom. The great American eclipse may or may not tell us anything about our future, but its peculiar path could remind us of something about our past, what it was we meant to be doing, and what we actually did along the way. And if it seems we need no reminding, consider this, we tend to backlight our history, and so run the risk of trying to recover a glory that never existed. When the light in August changes, watch carefully. Ristroth then follows the path of totality from Morgan, which, she laments, is predominantly white now, although it used to be home to Native Americans, through America's heartland, careful to remind readers that slavery used to be legal in some of the states along the path. When the eclipse gets to Missouri, things get interesting. The African-American population centers in Missouri are in the major urban areas, Kansas City and St. Louis, and the path of the eclipse will effectively bypass.